John Mack, the author of Abduction. Dr. John Mack. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Chris for taking this on and being uh, willing to show up here in Boston and with a couple of disreputable characters like Bud and me, and uh, shows his courage uh, and uh, pioneering spirit. I also want to express my appreciation to Bud uh, for, I don't know if I really feel this way actually, I'm not so sure I am appreciative that he introduced me to this field. I mean, it's been a lot of trouble actually. Uh, um, but I have deep fondness and admiration for his pioneering role and spirit in this. What, what I'd like to see happen here tonight is that we really deepen some questions. I happen to be very interested in the reality question or the ontological question as it's formally called in, in philosophy. And I hope to arouse and deepen your curiosity about all of this. Um, now, what happened to me with, with Bud is that uh, somebody asked if I wanted to meet him. This was the fall of 1989, and I, I'd never heard of him. And uh, they said, well, he's this guy that works with people who think they've been taken by aliens into spacecraft. And I said, he must be crazy if he believes that, and this must be some new form of psychosis. Well, I had a couple of free hours, and I went to see him, and I liked him. And he seemed sincere. He didn't seem crazy at all. And he was telling me about people who were telling stories that they didn't believe themselves, that they were questioning. They sounded like pretty healthy people, which I've seen now, uh, now worked intensively with uh, about 130 of these people, is that the stories are consistent. They are described with intense feeling, appropriate self-doubt. They are shocked when they hear other people have had the same experiences because that tends to affirm that it's real. They have nothing to gain by this. And they don't seem to fall into any category whatsoever. And as I've gone more deeply into this, uh, this is held up. Now, the fact that what they are describing isn't possible in our reality is not my fault. Uh, the, what, you then have a choice of trying to stretch what you might consider to be possible at that point. First, you have the event level element. Now, I, I say, I'm, I believe overall, this is a phenomenon of enormous complexity, meaning, and value for understanding of ourselves, who we are in the universe, and we're just beginning to grasp what this is about. So there aren't going to be answers here tonight, just deepening questions. First is the event level aspect. This is the sort of traumatic part of this mixture of subjective and objective elements that have to do with the intrusive, rape-like aspect for some people. The physical evidence is there. It's part of the picture, and it works together with the subjective evidence to create this picture. The trauma is not just what has happened. It's also what I call ontological shock. In other words, to the person having that experience, this is no more possible for them than it is for us. So we struggle together with that question. The second important element, for, in my perspective, is the information that occurs, and a great deal of this does have to do with the ecological aspect. In other words, the showing of the images, panorama of the planet destroyed, vast pollution, the earth destroyed on television-like monitors, through the eyes, in voice, mind-to-mind -mind communication by the beings, and this has an enormous impact on the consciousness of the individuals, and so much so that it affects deeply their choices in their lives, and I do believe this is not just deception, but I believe it's an important part of the phenomenon itself, and I see this in case after case, uh, next, you have uh, what I call the spiritual aspect of this phenomenon. This is the sense that people have that they're somehow being open to source, returning to their, their what they call home, with a capital H, the, the spiritual origin of, of all that is. And they feel that they are brought closer to that, and many experiencers feel that that's a fundamental part of this experience, that they're brought closer to the depth of being, the, uh, the, the Godhead, whatever you want to call it, there's different uh, language uh, for this. Here's one a young woman's way of describing this. She said, I think Source's purpose for letting that happen, that is allowing the aliens to come, is to bring back memory of us, of Source, to empower ourselves. I think it's almost like a baby going from crawling to walking and realizing that I am. That's what I think Source's reason for this, I am. And a fourth element, which is, again, uh, 
something where I think Bud and I differ is the relationship between the, and there is not one type of alien perceived, the most common of these grays with the big black eyes, which I'd never heard of when I started this work, but there are also various other kinds of beings. And Bud sees the relationship as cold and different um, in his autobiography, which he's sharing with me, he wrote at the very first page, he said, the mystery of those cold creatures who have come here from God knows where, subverting our truths and violating our planet. Well, there is that element in the beginning, but in my experience, if you work with the terror with the person, you, you, you work with the mystery, you have them sort of put the nose of the, the prow of the self into the phenomenon, that it does transform, that it does become more spiritual, that the growth does occur. And sometimes, there can be this, in not just this sort of transient sense of loving connection that is manipulated, but some deepening bond that lasts throughout this relationship across these dimensions, and that this is, is a very deep, powerful phenomenon. Why is there so much resistance to accepting, or at least uh, realizing what's going on? And I think at the heart of this, even more fundamental than the terror of the helplessness, the lack of control, we, we know that it represents that and people don't, are afraid that they can't protect their children and, and uh, that, that this is a, is a kind of um, intrusive, overwhelming kind of phenomenon. But I think even deeper than that is, is this ontological problem in that this absolutely defies our categories. In other words, if, if, if we are, um, if our worldview is one that can master knowledge through experiment, through the methods of basic science, this doesn't fall into a category that allows us to do that. It crosses over. You can't locate it. It is both physical and it is as if in another dimension at the same time. We can't get at it. The clients, although they'll make it clear this is it's not a dream, it's real, it's altogether real. I know a dream, I wake up from a dream, this is different, I have knowledge of this. But they, they'll say, but it's not this reality. It comes through as if through uh, the scrim of a theater uh, front and enters into our reality and it is in that reality altogether real and it introduces them to a deeper, under, um, a deeper fabric of, of reality that lies beyond uh, this one. It seems to me at the heart of what is called for now is that we ex allow this phenomenon to, through the questions we ask, to expand our notions of reality, to include unseen realities as perhaps even a deeper reality, but an other reality, not the, simply the objective physical world, and that we learn to value knowledge that comes from those realms. I was. Uh, an investor, a psychologist uh, in Mexico recently um, said uh, to me, and he was uh, only half joking, he says, if I can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And he was quite serious about that. But what this phenomenon, I think, along with many others, like the near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences, does it invites us to value knowledge that comes from the subtle realms. In other words, it, it, it asks us to credit our experiences, to develop criteria for how do we judge whether an experience can be uh, taken seriously. Is it because thousands of people are having the same experience? You could say, well, all having the same delusion. Well, how do we decide? I think these, these people haven't known each other. But they're doubtful about these experiences. I have certain criteria by which I decide this is, these experiences are to be taken seriously. It goes along with the physical evidence. It's that combination but we don't have a methodology yet. And I think um, I'd like to close with the point that I don't think that this phenomenon is going to be proven. In other words, I think that the deepening of our understanding and knowledge, the expansion of ourselves in relation to it and other similar phenomena is going to occur by crediting and allowing other ways of knowing about reality. It was expanding the way we know and what we credit as important. I don't think it's going to yield its secrets to the frameworks of proof that we have developed to apply to phenomena that are purely in the material world. Thanks. Thank you. Bud Hopkins, as you probably all know, is the author, maybe most famously, of Intruders. It's a book. It's also a general theory 
of what's going on here. Bud Hopkins. I am I'm very pleased to be here and flattered to be here, and uh, I would like to express my appreciation to John and to his associates and to Karen and those who planned this. I would just like to also say something about uh, my respect for John Mack, for his courage, for the difficulties that he's undergone in uh, bringing a very unconventional subject to the attention of uh, a university that perhaps uh, is overly frightened by something as new and dramatic as this, but I think any human being in this room would have to admit that if the UFO phenomenon is occurring, as the report suggests, it's the most important event in human history. And if that's the case, I don't think any institution or organization is being very wise uh, to uh, oppose the investigation, the serious investigation of such a phenomenon. In order to discuss this intelligently, we must know that the data we're relying on is reliable data, is solid. The data, of course, comes mainly from the reports of the people who've had these experiences, plus a whole range of attendant physical evidence, which I don't want to go into at this point. Now, what do we know about the UFO experience in terms of the reliability of what the aliens say? And I use the word aliens for one of a better term. The first thing is that the aliens are extraordinarily deceptive and operate in a covert manner. There was no doubt about that. There was no possible way that anyone who's looked into this phenomenon can say anything to the contrary of that simply because we have a whole history of what we have to call a screen memories when the UFO occupants make us see things that are not there in order to hide the way they actually appear. The way the memory of the experience very, very often has been stolen from us uh, which is not only an act of theft, it's an act of deception, and it can't possibly really be defended so far as I'm concerned. Now, there are all kinds of wonderful stories to illustrate this sort of control that they can have over our perceptions. Uh, I was working with a woman once who uh, was recalling an experience. She's on the table inside a ship. There's a physical examination taking place. It's extremely painful, uh, demeaning, and so forth, and she is not only enraged and furious, but she's scared to death and she's undergoing pain. And the head alien, as we know from these accounts, often happens, walks over, puts his hand across her forehead, and she said the pain disappeared. She felt waves of the most profound love she has ever felt in her life. She said she would sacrifice her own children for the love that she felt for this being. It was just beyond anything she'd ever known. No pain, no anger, and total love. He walked away from her. Took his hand away, of course. The pain came back. She began to get angry again. She was hurting again. She was furious again. And he came back, and he put his hand on her head, and she would have, again, sacrificed her children for that love. That kind of manipulation is, of course, something that's part and parcel with uh, the alien means of operating. At any rate, uh, this kind of deception goes on and on. Uh, people have been made to feel that they were themselves aliens in an early life made to see themselves as if they had alien hands and so forth. Uh, all kinds of imagery seems to be uh, played into people's heads. I know this totally sounds crazy. You have to read the background information supporting this. But I'm trying to start with what I assume many of you already know about the phenomenon. So the basic first point here is that uh, we can't trust the data, that uh, we can't trust what the aliens are saying to us under any conditions. Uh, as a second major fact, we know what happens to individuals who are, who are reporting abduction experiences psychologically. We know that they are psychologically scarred. The only set of psychological tests which, so, as far as I know, were ever done on this matter were done, uh, I was partly involved in this in 1981, Dr. Elizabeth Slater, a psychologist, tested a group of abductees or people reporting these experiences. She was not told the nature of the sample she was testing, anything about their UFO experiences, but she found that all of them shared three deficits psychologically. All have low self-esteem, all have a certain dissociation in their attitude towards their bodies, their physicality, their sexuality, and all had a lot of trouble trusting people. Well, at any rate, she pointed out when we later told her after she wrote a report the nature of the sample that she had tested and what they had experienced, and she said, though this doesn't prove anything, if these people had had the experiences they reported, 
uh, then these are precisely the kinds of deficits one would imagine would accrue. And um, she said it's very much like what happens when you get uh, a rape victim. Uh, now, the next thing is, are these experiences, and I'll try to be very brief, are these experiences transformational in any way? And of course they can be transformational in a wonderful way, provided they meet therapists and a support group and other people who are associates in this field uh, who can lead them uh, through their experiences in such a way that they understand that they're not crazy, that there's no uh, blame to be uh, ascribed to them, and so forth. The therapist, the support group, and friends and family provide the safety net that create that transformational experience. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Uh, we want these people to become much more whole. We want them to feel a sense of healing. Uh, it's an extremely uh, delicate and difficult new kind of procedure of therapy that has to be uh, developed really at this point. I'm not a therapist myself, uh, unlike John, but I feel that what we do if we work with these people is a kind of, is a kind of de facto therapy. Will you sum it up by describing the nature of the reality plane that you think okay. you know, that this is real in? Very good. The, the nature of the plane is this. The UFO phenomenon runs a, a tremendous 180 degree gamut from being totally physical, nuts and bolts. When the thing comes down, it could break the tree branches down from the top, leave marks on the ground. People are floated out of buildings, uh, are uh, scarred, their bodies are marked. The craft can show up on radar, they can be photographed, etc. Totally physical. And on the other end, totally paranormal. All the communication is telepathic. Uh, the uh, craft can be apparently unseeable at some points. We know that people can be floated through walls and they're actually missing. This is not an out-of-body experience, it's an out-of-the-house experience. The hardest thing, the hardest thing for uh, scientists to accept is the idea that it is both physical and so totally paranormal. The whole paradigm of what's possible, of course, has to be expanded. And the last thing I'd like to do, uh, Chris, if I may, I'd like to read a short statement that a woman wrote, an abductee, uh, about her attitude, she's a psychotherapist, uh, how she has dealt with this kind of transformation. Uh, she said, we of the earth are in possession, due perhaps to our biology, of an innate humanness, which is often translated into a deeply spiritual humanism. It's the basis of our moral sense of the feelings of caring, empathy, love, and responsibility we have for one another, for our children, and for the planet. From my experiences with the aliens, I've come to believe that their entire paradigm is radically different from ours, and that our sense of right and wrong, good and bad, does not apply for them. They're very different from us, not only physically, but in their understandings, motives, goals, and purposes. I do not believe that they are the great redeeming power some may wish for, but only beings with a different set of principles. Therefore, we must assume responsibility for ourselves and each other. It places the burden of care for one another and for the planet squarely with each one of us. For what can we gain from them if not the understanding of our own nature as a species, using them for comparison? My curiosity about them is unbounded, as is my grief, confusion, and fear. But what I have found, what I return to each day, be it coping mechanism or epiphany, is that I want to immerse myself in my humanity, in my humanism, in my caring for other humans, for life on our planet, and for the Earth itself. And this statement of hers is a statement which I absolutely 100% endorse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there differences to probe here? Are there things you want to ask about each other's presentations? Okay, I, I had a question, John, when you talked about <clears throat> when you work with people, and it takes on a deeper, more spiritual level and so forth. Um, the model that uh, presents itself to me is that we know these experiences happen from childhood on. And let's assume a giant pyramid of individuals. Well, let's assume at the bottom of this pyramid are all the people who uh, either die along the way or have terrible psychological problems, become <clears throat> substance abusers or whatever it is. Um, up a little further are people who have had more understanding uh, Counselors, parents, whatever, been listening to them perhaps they were stronger, and perhaps they're handling these things a little better with fewer psychological problems. Uh, you go higher in the pyramid and you find a few people, 
who were uh, who were lucky and they have run into a John Mack or David Jacobs or many of the people doing this kind of work and have been helped by them and not a support group and they're doing much better and finally at, at that top <clears throat> we find a group a small group that has managed to somehow transform themselves uh, with all of that support uh, and in a certain sense at that top of that apex of the of the uh, triangle are those lucky few who survived intact more or less and down at the bottom are the vast majority who are having a lot of trouble with this uh, I can't look at that myself with, and get granted any kind of moral uh, approval, I find that extraordinarily upsetting. And if this is what the alien phenomenon is putting human beings through, I don't want any part of it. Uh, my feeling has always been that uh, they may be here ultimately for good purposes or be ecologically concerned or whatnot. They're doctors to heal the planet, but I don't like the bedside manner in the meantime. And uh, so that's why I find it very difficult uh, to to look at that in any kind of way. I think I've seen over the 22 years I've been doing this, I've seen far too much pain, uh, far too much damage, far too much psychologically and physical damage done to people. And I don't think that this is deliberate. I don't think the UFO occupants are intending it, but I've just seen too much pain to uh, indulge it with the idea that somehow it's going to all turn out okay. That's my basic okay. issue. John that. Um, I guess I'd like to try to take the discussion out of the question of uh, whether these, this is benign uh, or malevolent. I, I don't really see it that way. Uh, and I don't, I don't for a moment deny that people have had uh, deeply troubling, uh, traumatic, disturbing experiences, have, uh, in rare occasions have uh, contemplated uh, suicide. Um, uh, there's an irony here, in a way, but because I, uh, I'm supposed to be the psychiatrist here, right? I'm supposed to see the, the really troubled, disturbed people, and it almost seems as if uh, you're seeing the worst cases uh, from the mental health standpoint, and I'm seeing the sort of more um, sort of seeking ones, which may have to do with who we are and how we work and what goes on. So I, I don't want to get into, I don't want to give the impression that I think this is, as sometimes I'm quoted as saying, this is all sort of good and it's enlightened and it's all going to turn out for, for the better and it's uh, simply godlike. No, uh, this is highly traumatic for many people. It is deeply disturbing. First of all, it's traumatic in simply the helplessness being taken against the will. It's traumatic because it's, this is still not acceptable in this culture, so people are isolated, they can't talk about it, they don't get sympathy like they would for more uh, generally considered forms of abuse. Alien abuse is not something that you can go talking about with your, even with your parents and colleagues, although this may be changing some. Then it is ontologically traumatic. This just can't be. It shocks everything people believe about the world. And then finally, it isn't over when it's over. It can recur at any time. Or, Parents are troubled that they can't protect their children. All that is true. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I don't find that the people that have these experiences, uh, they tend to be way over on the healthy end of the spectrum of people that I've seen. I, I mean it in terms of their ability to handle it, the fact that a little goes a long way, that they seem to be able to integrate it with a, a minimum of help, that they often will feel themselves part of some life-giving process, it's not simply traumatic, and that if they stay with it, the whole quality of the experience changes. The quality of the relationship with the beings, uh, again in quotes, changes. So, um, again, I, I don't want to leave the impression that I don't uh, 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 know the suffering that goes on, but I, but something else occurs. Uh, Can I ask as you a question, yeah. starting with Bud? But you started by saying that if the UFOs are real, this is the most important event in the history of the species. Uh, big if, but it's a plausible conclusion. However, I, I find it somewhat, you, you've got the telescope uh, pointed in the wrong direction here. You talk about wanting to help heal the people who received the message. That seems to me uh, utterly illogical in terms of your premise that this is the most if it's the most important event in human history, if we're getting a message from someplace else about the fundamental nature of reality, 
I mean, to be blunt about it, who cares that it hurt a few people on the way? What about the message? What is the message? How do we know it's true? You know, what's the story here? If, if it's if if they're real, and this is the most important news uh, of you know of human history, what the hell is the news? Well, of course, uh, <clears throat> the reason we do investigations is to find the answer to those questions. We're in the middle of an investigation. <clears throat> I'd be the last person to sit here and say, we know the answers to those questions. What is going to happen? We don't know what the end term is, uh, so I'm merging an investigation. But, uh, it's kind of amusing, uh, as John probably knows, that uh, there have been several different people who we've both been seeing. And uh, one young man said to me that, he said, it's funny, but I come to New York to see you when I need to feel uh, stable and grounded, and I go to see John when I need to feel excited and uplifted. And uh, we could just end the evening right there. Which, which I, I think, uh, I think that's funny considering that I'm the artist and, and he's a psychiatrist. I think it's a mix up. But uh, the point is, obviously, I uh, work with people in the terms in terms of a certain attitude of triage. Whoever's bleeding the worst uh, gets seen first by me. As you work with them and as they come to see this and so forth, then the spiritual interpretation comes in, then they feel better about it. But that, again, is due to John's intervention. What you have to ask yourself is, if these people have been dealing with the aliens on their own for 25 or 35 years or whatever, and they're devastated, and there's a, there's a final, ultimately very good uh, outcome, then I think John should get the credit, not the aliens. Well, there's something a little weird going on here, because... Um, I mean, I, I come from a very secular, uh, rationalist background. You know, people, well, this is John's sort of religious, spiritual viewpoint, uh, or seeking, or whatever. That's not how I, at least not how I saw myself growing up. I saw my, oh, my, my father was an English professor, very academic. Uh, the whole notion of God was rather uh, treated as, uh, we know better than that, that's... Uh, we read the Bible in the household as purely as literature, not as a spiritual document. Now you can say, well, I have this sort of hidden hunger for spirituality, so that you know it emerges. But, but I, I was very slow to see this phenomenon in those terms. I, my, my sense is I learned this from the people, not that I brought that to them. Your whole sense, uh, as you said, was that this is, this is a kind of information that defies our basic categories that we think in, certainly you in the medical scientific world. I gotta say, I'm, I'm struck uh, that this is uh, extremely familiar in terms of the categories that most of us live in. You say it's counterintuitive, but the images of aliens that people report to you are very familiar stuff on television, in popular movies, what if these things aren't really counterintuitive or countercultural at all, but they're basically the oldest myths of, uh, of, of humanity, just reappearing in fresh form? Well, there are a thousand reasons <clears throat> why that's not the case. And it has to do with the fact that <clears throat> UFOs were studied first by the Air Force as a Nazi secret weapon during World War II. Nobody thought they were That doesn't godly. make them well, out of space. That makes no, no, they, that journey. made them physical. Okay. Physical. Okay. Uh, so we start with the idea that there are physical things flying around that accompany planes, with, and then we find that they can be photographed, they turn up on radar, and no one knows what they are. There's no religious belief attached to them. There's nothing of myth attached to them. These things leave marks on the ground when they land. They have a total physicality. Now you talked about the image of the aliens being familiar. Why? And that's because those images were presented very strongly and clearly in the film uh, Close Encounters, uh, Steven Spielberg movie, because his a special effects people went to Alan Hynek and the Center for UFO Studies to get an account of what these things actually look like. And we get the same drawings from people in countries that are people are totally illiterate and so forth. John, will you take a crack at the, the whole question of whether this indeed is counterintuitive or in fact deeply sort of culture affirmative? The abduction phenomenon doesn't fall nicely into any kind of Judeo-Christian mythic structure with which I, I'm familiar from my reading of the Bible. It, it actually goes against it. It's, it's rather at, at the most uh, obvious manifest level. Uh, in fact, uh, it's often called, it must come from the devil because it's so unimaginatively uh, sort of 
real and crude, you know, little guys with big black eyes or luminous beings or reptilian ones or insect-like ones coming in, taking people against their will, leaving marks on their bodies. Uh, at the first blush, it's rather anything but the glorious mythic narratives of, of, a, of a formal religion. It doesn't resemble it at all. It, I think it does defy categories, and it does call for a discipline, that, as Bud is saying, that is rather new. Now, I want this media thing comes up all the time, what people are getting from the media. Let me ask you, if you see somebody who is deeply depressed, for instance, and they watch a program uh, on, say, uh, Nightline, or they uh, on one of the self-help uh, programs, and they talk about depression, would you argue and that person comes in deeply depressed, that they invented the depression because they happened to see something on the television? No. What they might do is they bring in a few terms that would help them give language to what they had seen. But I don't have the experience as a clinician of people inventing a powerful, deeply held experience from which you cannot shake them because they happen to see a few images on the te television set. It doesn't work like that. And as Bud said, in this phenomenon, the media follow the research. Somebody once said to me, uh, oh, this whole abduction phenomenon, is, it's like a cult. And I said, it's very interesting to bring that up because this is the precise opposite of a cult. A cult like, let's say, the Reverend Moon or something like that, is all beliefs and no miracles. And we're all miracles and no beliefs. Because we literally do not know what this entails, what is going to happen next. Uh, we don't know really the, the physical nature of this. We know it has, it has totally physical properties, at least some of the time. Uh, it is, the, the, the basic thing is that all of humanity, I think, wants to put this phenomenon into the gods or devils category. We, we have a, a, the old paradigm is that there are demons out there and there are godlike beings out there, and this, by God, we're going to make it fit. Hey, this, it doesn't fit. We're going to end up agreeing and fighting with him. It doesn't fit. Yeah. Yeah. So, I wish you'd both sort of give us a minute wrap, sum up what we've learned and what we ought to be thinking about as we depart. I, I'm, I've taken a complete pledge for myself against any judgment on my own part. I'd love to hear judgments from you, though, about what kind of ground we've covered and where we are. Uh, in terms of what we've accomplished tonight, I think one thing is that we've shown that in terms of the raw data, uh, John and I really have exactly the same kinds of material presented uh, by the populations that we've worked with over these many years. Uh, I think that the basic difference comes in terms of the interpretation, the spin put on the experiences. And I think that um, in general, uh, I suppose John is urging a more, um, a greater curiosity on the part of, of uh, the people he works with about the aliens themselves and about what uh, their intentions may be and the whole issue that he's mentioned about uh, uh, ecological concerns and so on. Uh, I tend to, uh, by contrast, I think, try to accent uh, living well as the best revenge, so to speak, uh, trying to get people to face the richness of their own lives, their own uh, resources, their own inner strengths, and to put the aliens as much out of their minds as they possibly can to try to live a normal life. Uh, there's no way, of course, when you tell somebody who's been through this to put the aliens out of their mind. No one ever possibly can. Uh, because it's too enormous a fact. But I think that uh, I want this to be a world in which uh, the human spirit is central and it's our deepest and most important value and we're not uh, looking in a needy way uh, to some external force that is as mysterious and elusive and misleading as uh, the UFO occupants. I simply don't trust them. And, uh, I feel that what we have to learn is what we have within us to begin with and what other humans can give us. And that's as simple as I can state it as uh, uh, my position on this whole crazy business. Yeah, I think I feel less um, kind of protective and anthropocentric than, than Bud does. And as I, I think that um, uh, I don't see that, I, I don't feel that this is, is unwelcome in general. I know that it's traumatic for many people, and I think that, is, as we've said, that we need to work with people's uh, distresses, but I think that the phenomenon has such vast implications for us in terms of 
who we are in in our universe. And it it seems to me that in a certain mm -hmm. sense, anything that can kind of shatter this arrogance around the notion that we're the superior intelligence alone in the cosmos is in general a rather good thing. In other words, that that uh, um, that it can open us to vast other realms of reality that are far beyond this immediate, however pleasant, uh, Earth environment. I think that this phenomenon, insofar as it undercuts and, and does some damage to that anthropocentrism, is a good thing. That doesn't mean I don't think human beings can be wonderful and have a wonderful, resilient spirit, but uh, uh, I think we, are, uh, we also have um, a tremendous kind of um, cosmic egoism, which uh, this phenomenon has a way of uh, uh, rather uh, challenging, to say the least. So uh, that's kind of where I am with it. I think, excellent. I think those are two eloquent summations. Mm -hmm.